Let's start pulling all of this together. This is a complex picture and we need to get it down. Let's start, walk through it, kind of the, the big picture now. So um, considering a neuron that is at rest, so its membrane potential is minus 70 millivolts, okay, something happens to stimulate that cell. This could be, going back to the familiar example, maybe you touch something that's cold or hot, you experience some type of a stimulus and that sort of triggers the cell to, be, to become um, excited. So there's some sort of a stimulus that takes place and that causes the first few sodium channels to be opened. As soon as those sodium channels open, sodium is gonna rush inside of the cell. The cell is becoming depolarized in the process. As that takes place, that triggers more sodium channels to open. These are voltage gated. So as the cell becomes depolarized, more of these voltage gated sodium channels are going to open. That in turn, leads to more sodium rushing into the cell, and that's gonna cause even more depolarization. So essentially what this is, this is a positive feedback loop. Once it gets going, it just kind of upregulates itself. So positive feedback. That positive feedback ultimately causes the membrane potential to climb into the positives. It's going to go all the way up to plus 30 millivolts. And that is a triggering event. That's going to cause this positive feedback loop to come to an end. So at that point, uh, remember that ball and chain, the ball swings into place, closes off the sodium channels, and something else takes place also. As those sodium channels close, the voltage-gated potassium channels open up. And that's gonna bring us down here into this side. That opening of the potassium channels results in a repolarization of the membrane. So those potassium channels um, allow potassium to move out of the cell. So that leads to repolarization. And that's a great example of a negative feedback loop. It's bringing things back to the normal resting condition. All of this can be represented very nicely on a graph. This is a graph that we're going to be becoming very familiar with. This is a graph of an action potential. This whole series of events is called an action potential. Neurons um, experience action potentials and this is how they send electrical signals. So on this action potential graph, notice what's being plotted. We have the membrane potential of the cell on this axis and we have time on this axis. So let's just follow through on the graph. The cell starts out with a membrane potential of minus 70, that's its resting value. There's some type of a stimulus that takes place in order to trigger this action potential to happen. If that stimulus is strong enough to bring the membrane potential to minus 55, that's the threshold potential that will cause the rest of this to, to, to take place. Once it starts, it's gonna be an all or nothing event. As soon as we tick upwards right here, the rest of this graph is gonna follow automatically. So you might be wondering at this point, I haven't really said much about the stimulus. Uh, what is it that would cause this initial membrane potential to change? This could, just to give an example with, uh, think of your finger. If you touch something, if you touch some surface and you, you feel it, <laughs> you feel the surface, essentially what's happening is when you push down on that surface, you're causing a local deformation of the plasma membranes of the cells. Okay, so that plasma membrane might be bending just a little, a little bit. There are actually some ion channels that are mechanically gated. So if you bend the plasma membrane, that might be enough to allow just a few ion channels to open. That would correspond or be an example of um, the type of stimulus this might be referring to. So there's that initial event that causes just a few ion channels to open. And then if the membrane potential reaches threshold, then the voltage gated channels are gonna pop open as well and, and the whole rest of this um, action potential will take place. So if we reach threshold right there at minus 55 millivolts, then what happens next is depolarization. That's this climb in the graph. This is where sodium is rushing into the cell through those voltage gated sodium channels. When we reach plus 30, the voltage gated sodium channels snap closed and the voltage gated potassium channels open. So potassium rushes out of the cell during this time. This is called repolarization. And in fact, notice we kind of overshoot 
um, the resting membrane potential right here. We go a little bit even further than that. We go down into the more negative. So this is a time where the cell is hyperpolarized and eventually things level back out to the resting membrane potential of minus 70. And the reason this happens is because potassium's equilibrium potential is in the negatives. So if you'll remember, we calculated that back in the last chapter. So this is just uh, potassium trying to reach its, its equilibrium potential, but these voltage-gated potassium channels do close eventually, and so it, it doesn't quite make it there. Um, the reason that it climbs back up to the normal resting membrane potential is because sodium potassium pumps are active and they're doing their job. So sodium potassium pumps ultimately reestablish this resting membrane potential of minus 70. So that's an action potential. I have a little bit more on this slide about the hyperpolarization that we were just talking about and a couple of different graphs, ways to look at this. Um, this top one is showing the membrane potential and just really pointing out what's causing each section of the graph. This other one is, is interesting because it splits up the ions. So it's talking about um, diffusion of sodium and diffusion of potassium. And again, just looking at each of the ions individually to kind of elaborate on this a little bit more as, as you think through it. There are a few more things you'll need to know about action potentials. Action potentials are all or nothing events. As soon as they start, they're gonna happen. As long as the threshold is reached, that stimulus brings the cell to threshold, the rest of the action potential will take place. So that's called the all or none law. And interestingly, the size of the stimulus doesn't really matter. As long as threshold is reached, uh, the action potential is always going to go up to plus 30 and then drop back down. So the size of the action potential, it's not like it scales. An action potential is an action potential. It's not like you can have a big one or a small one. So that kind of brings up the question, well, what is it that allows us to detect different levels of, of stimulus? Like you could push on something very lightly or you could push on something really hard and you're, gonna, you're going to feel a difference in those two scenarios. So what is it that's sort of encoding that information? Well, it turns out it's the frequency of the action potentials. So if we pop over to this graph, consider a very low stimulus. So you're, you're pushing on something, but very, very gently. Um, Okay, as long as you push hard enough to reach threshold, you will feel the surface that you're pushing on. Okay, so you will have a series of action potentials that make you aware of that surface. If you push even harder, like maybe it even starts to hurt a little bit, um, when you push harder, so you increase the strength of the stimulus, what happens is the action potentials are occurring more frequently. So they always have that same magnitude, they always go up to the same height, plus 30 on the graph, uh, but they're just occurring more frequently. So we would say that stimulus intensity is encoded by how frequently the action potentials occur. There's also a recruitment process that might take place. A stronger stimulus can cause more neurons to be involved in the signaling. So that's another type of, of way that we could um, detect stimulus intensity. One other thing, we've mentioned this in passing already, but just the fact that there is a refractory period. Remember we said those voltage-gated sodium channels get deactivated with the ball and chain? This means that there's a set amount of time uh, between action potentials during which the cell can't send another. That's called a refractory period. And there is a refractory period after every single action potential. Let's take a look at the next graph to, to think about that a little bit more. So over here is the stimulus and right here is threshold. As long as we reach threshold, an action potential will take place. So right here we have sodium ions rushing into the cell. Here we have potassium ions rushing out of the cell. And that ultimately leads to the hyperpolarization down here. So in terms of refractory periods, um, as soon as this action potential is initiated, Essentially, there's what we would call an absolute refractory period. This is a period of time where it's not possible for the cell to start another action potential. Okay, so this one is going to have to finish um, before the cell will be able to do another one. And the big reason for that is because those sodium channels get inactivated with the ball and chain. That takes a bit of time to reset. So during that period, it's just 
just not possible to send another action potential. Uh, but then there's also, if we head over into this region, there's also what we would call a relative refractory period. And during this time, shown in blue on this graph, um, this is a period of time where the sodium channels, they have reset, so they're, they're ready to go again, but the cell is in a hyperpolarized state. So this means even if we apply a stimulus, if, if we apply this same stimulus okay, on this cell, um, if we bump, bump up on the graph right there, um, that's not quite gonna be enough to get us up to threshold. Threshold would be all the way up here. So the fact that the cell is hyperpolarized, this just means that it's harder to initiate an action potential. It takes a larger stimulus, a greater stimulus, in order to reach the threshold potential of minus 55. So a lot of times this is called a relative refractory period. It's not that it's not capable of doing an action potential, it's just that it would take some something big in order to cause an action potential to happen during that time.